Ahoy, everyone. This is David Perry with my continuing series of interviews with artists and colleagues around the world, talking about how we get from the great pause of this year into the great return. And today I'm very happy to speak with someone who has made an artistic contribution to the strangest of years. Please welcome Florian Hetz speaking to us from Berlin. Florian, welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. So it's evening there in Berlin here on a Friday in the United States where we're all waiting for a big deal of political news, but you're staying away from that and I applaud you for that. <laughs> Tell us though, before we begin talking about your art, what is the situation like now in Berlin vis-a-vis -vis COVID? Um, we are in a partial lockdown since um, November 2nd or 3rd, um, which means like we are, we can go grocery shopping, we can be outside on our own or like with one other person, but like the, like you cannot really meet bigger crowds anymore, which we had like during summer, we had this short, comfortable break where things felt a little bit more normal. And now it's just back to being kind of like avoiding people as much as possible to bring the curve down. Um, museums, theaters, like a lot of cultural places are closed, which is quite harsh for people working in that sector. Um, on the other hand, like um, grocery shops or shops in general are open. So like you can go to Ikea, but you cannot go to see the Nafretity in, in, at the museum. So this is our situation at the moment. What is the uh, protocol for mask wearing? Is it mandatory in Berlin? Uh, masks are mandatory as soon as you enter any space. So um, you cannot go into a shop without a mask. You cannot go by public transport or a taxi without a mask. Um, there are certain areas in Berlin, or certain streets where you have to wear them outside as well. And it's highly recommended that you wear them like once you leave your house, but it's not mandatory to, to wear it everywhere on the street. And but, what is the impact specifically on the, the queer community? Um, have you noticed any difference? And well, obviously, I mean, just socializing in general is different for everybody. Well, that yes, but like I think um, for me, like I think for many others, it was weird that for a long period of time here, not only here in Berlin, but like everywhere, I think in the world, like people were still partying. So like, I still haven't found my way of dealing with that, that people are just kind of like really insisting on their right to go to party and to like, it, it didn't really felt like many people were doing a change also in the queer community. So like um, dating apps and all of that things like were as busy as always it felt. Um, so it's hard for me like to say much about it because I'm relatively recl reclusive. Um, but I think for a certain person, personality type, I think it must be really hard at the moment. Like if you are an introvert and you feed on these constant um, validations and contacts even, then it must be really hard for me personally. Like it's, um, there's not much change. Like I, I really enjoyed the first lockdown in, in March. And now this one is like, I'm not a winter person. So normally like in winter, I go to California. <laughs> um, this year I'm going to stay here and so like I'm going into hibernation so it, which means like I'm not seeing many people I'm focusing on my work I do a lot of archival and, and studio stuff so nothing changes much so like for me personally like things are pretty much the same as any other um, winter just that I can't go to a coffee place and like sit down in a cafe like I, I drink my coffee at home Right. Well, now you are one of more than 50 artists who are featured in a new book from Ginkgo Press from Berkeley, California, an extraordinary collection of work by queer artists around the world. It's called uh, Queer New Queer Photography, Focus on the Margins, about marginalized populations. And I was fascinated by your work, saw that you had worked with or associated with the Tom of Finland Foundation. And when I first read that before I looked at your work, I expected something totally different. Uh, your work is much closer in, as it as it were. Um, it's I wouldn't say it's so much erotic as it is biological. You look at it, and sometimes I wonder: Am I looking at a man? Am I looking at a woman? Am I looking at a mountaintop? Is that a bush or is that an armpit? 
where did you get the idea for the type of work that you do? I think it's not so much of an idea as a kind of like a natural way of the way that I see, or the way that I look at things. Um, like, I, like I have to make a, make a bigger round of that. Like, um, like when I grew up, like I, I grew up like in a kind of like a remote area, like in a, in a village situation in Bavaria. Um, like my family's not from there. We moved there. I knew I didn't belong there. Like the, the classical queer story of kind of like you're somehow trapped in the middle of, of nowhere. You don't want to be there. There's something outside that you can't reach. There wasn't internet back then. Um, so like I grew up like with, with old Hollywood movies the like photo books like a lot of about Hollywood so like I grew up with the imagery of Karen Sinclair Bull like the big MGM um, movie photographer uh, George Harrell like all of these things so like I, I grew up with these images and then like fashion magazines like all pretty much the, the same story that many of us have like eventually like I made my way to the to the big city and did everything else than photography. Like I never wanted to be a photographer, like, but, but I always surrounded myself with imagery. So like I was, the way that I looked at things was always really, like really close. I was drawing a lot. And like when I, back then when I was drawing, like I would always draw details. It was never, sometimes a portrait, but it was never really interested in the whole person. And um, so there was already a starting point of kind of like really focusing like on an eye or like just a kind of like a, the shape of a, of a cheekbone, like all of these things where like where I could really say that I was drawn to these, these ways of looking at details and not so much of a big thing. Um, skip forward like a couple, like many years later, like I ended up in hospital with a brain inflammation, like an encephalitis which nearly, well, it knocked me out. Like I was in the hospital for a couple of weeks and they were fighting quite a lot. In that time, my brain took a hit basically, like, and I had massive problems like to, to memorize normal things, like regular things in order to keep these, like, I wasn't really up for, for writing a, a diary or anything, but like my doctors are like, why don't you try to, record things or like may find a way of like really like just remember it by writing it down was like it's not my thing so like I always had a little camera on me like back in the day like to take photos of my friends like mostly drag queens like the way we're hanging out and like going out and so I started to document my daily life and that was really like little things that were not necessarily artistically interesting but it could have been like a, part of a plate or like a cup or something. But when I looked at it like a couple of days later, I could remember that moment. So like from there, like taking taking photos of like these little things um, that developed into a habit or like that conditioned me more like into like thinking photographically. And when I started to take my first photos like with a proper camera and like when I with with people that I was not connected to like I immediately started the same thing that I did when I was drawing like I was taking photos of the of the parts that I was interested in so when I look at, at people like when I talk with them like I I stare a little bit like I'm German we like to stare but um I do tend to focus on details and I, I see a lot of things that other people tend to oversee which surprises me like I I, I see like the the beauty of like the hair on, on, on fingers that are like in the in the sunshine and have a reflection like these and automatically like I, I see these things and I concentrate on them and that's what I want to want to shoot like I started to zoom out a little bit in the last couple of years and a lot of that has to do with California but still to the day like um if I have someone in front of me and you give me a camera I probably will focus on a, a little thing and there is there's going to be something that I find interesting so like if you were photographing me right now, what would you focus on? It's such a small photo, like um, no. image. It's, it's turn it a little bit to the sides, like just to, yeah, there we go. Like you have beautiful neck situation, neck, ear. Yeah, I, say, I think like I really would start probably like with this area here and then like move, move out. Mm -hmm. Like I'm pretty sure like, 
if you would open your your um, shirt a little bit more, like all of this here would be really nice. Like you have a really strong chin, which is quite fascinating. But also your lips. Like I think like we we'll, would have a, a lot to take photos of. So when when you come to California, when all the COVID restrictions are over, I'll my husband and I will have you over to our house in Palm Springs, and I'll I'll let you have it. I would love to. I would love to. I love Palm Springs. So, you know, I, I was reading about your bout of encephalitis and how it impacted your work. You know, now we're living in the middle of another health situation that is not specific to you, but impacting the whole world. How do you think, I mean, with encephalitis having clearly, I wouldn't say transformed your work, but clearly had an impact on it, as you just described. How do you think COVID is going to have an impact on your work or do you think it will? Uh, yeah, I think I think it will it will somehow um, influence us, like all of us in one way or the other. Like for me, like this year, I barely ever shot people. Like I shot a lot of still lives, a lot of things around me, which I haven't done so much before. Like I've, I've done it, but like it was not my focus. Before people were still like my main focus. I'm still not done with skin texture or skin color, but um, this year, like because I didn't want to have one-on-one -on -one shoots or like be so close to people, like I barely shot anyone. Um, so that, that already changed it. And it's quite exciting. Like I'm not, I'm not regretting that. Like there's a mm -hmm. lot of really interesting work that I've done um, in, in that time that is like, I still haven't really cited it so much. Like, I've, like as I like now, like November, December, January, February, like these days, these months are gonna be like really for, like being in the studio and being in my archive and really working on these photos and see what is there and then seeing what I do with them. But um, that's a big new step. So like I can imagine like having like a new book coming out next year, like really barely without any people, but like more mm -hmm. like working on, on a different form. So talk to me about the book, Queer Photography, focus on the margins. What was it like working with Benjamin Wahlbergs and, and how did you come to be one of the artists he selected. And, and have you met any of the other artists that are in the book? Um, so like Benjamin contacted me, I think last year or one and a half years ago, maybe maximum um, with his, with a pitch, like with an idea and which I found generally, I found interesting, but um, it was really vague. And then like the more we talked, like the more the detail they got. And it was clear that he really wanted to create a book that was mm -hmm. not necessarily only focusing on like the skinny white boy that is pretty everywhere, like that you can see anywhere in every queer publication at the moment or gay publication probably even more. Um, and that was the interesting part for me because like, I mean, as I said before, I grew up with books and I have a lot of books and I have a lot of these books. So like, I, like what I always was missing was like the, the book that Benjamin basically did with new queer uh, photography to have like a wide, wide range of different photographers working in different fields, different nationalities, ethnicities, bringing their, their work together. And like, if you, if you go through the book and like really like, just like, it, it, it all makes sense. Like there is a, it's a really fantastic way of seeing what is going on at the moment, like in, in this, in our times right now, in terms of queer photography. Um, I do know uh, actually quite a lot of the photographers in the book. Um, I exhibited with a couple of them. Some of them are my friends, like Matt Lambert, for example, is a really close friend of mine. We, in, like, we live in, in, a, in a close neighborhood. So like he's one of the few, he and his, his husband are a few people that I actually see during COVID. Um, yeah. Well, and what do you think, or what, well, I'm what you think, how would you interpret the subtitle, focus on the margins? What is meant, what do you take away is meant by margins? I think the margins in, in that sense for me, like was really kind of like not the, the queer photography that we're used to. Like that is basically seen in, <coughs> sorry, seen in many, major queer publications that is, or like there has been like in the nineties or two thousands, like the big muscle boy that is, has the perfectly sculpted body, 
um, like to move away from that and like opening up to what is there as well, like that has probably not had the chance to be seen so much in the last, let's say 20 years, but like just recently in the last couple of years, finally, like due to, due to social media probably, but also due to the internet in general, like had, they came like, to a bigger audience, I think. So like, I think Benjamin really wanted to focus and like, I'm, he might, I might be completely wrong and then he might roll his eyes now, but I think really he wanted to focus on people that, or the a majority of the people that had not the chance to be seen that much in a, in a wider, for a wider audience and that needed to be seen. Mm-hmm. And I think like for him, like as much as I understood, like it was also a journey. Like he started with a couple of fixed points and um, with, with that, like he, he started to learn and like to, to find out more about other people. And I think you can, you can, it feels like his own private journey, like as well a little bit. Like, and I know like he was, he was influenced or like by the work of Matt Lambert and by mine as well, like as a starting point. But then like, if you, if you take that as a starting point and then like see where he ended, like that is pretty amazing. And I think like we all kind of like have something that the other one doesn't necessarily show or have, but like we, we don't take from each other, like we add on to it something mm-hmm. and show there's, a, there's, another, there's another way of seeing, showing things. Mm-hmm. For me, it was interesting. And that, was, um, that is something that I, I, I still need to ask him is um, like he like the way like to, to work with him was was quite easy like he um, he asked me like if I would be interested I was like yeah sure and I was like well why don't you send me a couple of photos and I send him like quite a big selection I think and then like he chose out of that selection and um, what he chose was for me like is is really one line like it's, it's just gingers it's like really white skin um, which. It is nice, but like it's it's a tiny little part of my work. Um, so that that was that was fascinating for me that he was like really concentrating on on that part and on this on this really specific um, skin type, let's say. Yeah. In our last few moments, talk to me about what you would like people who view your art to take away from seeing one of your photos, specifically those in queer, new queer photography, focus on the margins? Um, what do I want them to take away? Um, for me, like the, the fascination is like, if we boil it down to the photos that are in the book, it's like really about skin and, and skin color and our weird idea about skin color. Like white, white skin is not white, black skin is not black. Like for me as a photographer, but also as a studio worker, it's like it's it's interesting to see what actually is in the, in the skin. Like there's yellow, there's there's violet, there's orange, there's blue. There's so many colors in there um, that the way that we talk about skin is so wrong. So last question: When COVID is over, quote unquote, whatever that means, uh, what is the first thing that you are going to explore photographing? Will your work change drastically? I think once that's over, like I'm gonna sit on a flight to to Los Angeles and gonna <laughs> jump on my bike there, like I have a push bike in LA, and just start to take photos outside again, like in that beautiful light. Um, I I don't know, like in the journey that COVID put me on right now, work wise, like I want to continue that. Like I I don't want to abandon people. Like I said, like I'm not I'm not done with that yet. Like I'm still there's still things that I haven't done that I'm interested in, but I would love to explore California and its nature a little bit more photographically. So um, yeah, wait, like once that is over, you'll see me, <laughs> you see me in Cali. Like I, I definitely come to Palm Springs. Great, we look forward to it. This is David Perry. We've been speaking with Florian Hetz, photographer speaking to us from Berlin and one of the more than 50 artists featured in the new book, New Queer Photography, Focus on the Margins from Ginkgo Press. Thanks everyone, ahoy.